My name is Francis Mapindani. I'm a CITCO agronomist covering uh, Mashona, Land, uh, Mashona Land East Province. And today I will be talking about the tomato varieties that CITCO has to offer uh, to our farmers so that at least we get um, the best possible return that uh, is possible uh, using all CITCO genetics when it comes to tomatoes. So the first thing that I'll talk of as we start our tomato production is to look at the essential elements for tomato production. We're looking at the genetics, which is the seed that we're going to use. What kind of genetic material are we going to use? What potential do they have to give us the best possible um, uh, return that we want as farmers, which is usually something that's tied to the yield. So the genetics plays a very pivotal part when it comes to that. The weather Weather is very important as well. Whether we're looking at tomatoes being very frost sensitive and also being tomatoes, uh, being crops that are very susceptible to disease pressure, especially the late blight and also the uh, early blight that usually affect our tomatoes during the rainy season. And uh, we also have to look at something that the weather comes into play with as well. We're looking at um, the pressure that comes with pests during the hot uh, summer period usually between the October and the November window. We have a very terrible pressure when it comes to Tuta Absoluta, Red Spider, White Fly, it would be a nightmare. It's something that usually is tied to the weather. So we have to look at the weather and how best it comes through as an essential element to our crops in terms of understanding how best we can try to harness what the weather brings to our uh, table and how best we can try to circumnavigate some of the negative traits that it may bring as well. Then we have to look at the soils. Our soil is very important. That's where our crop is going to grow. That's where it's going to get all of these nutrients. So the pH is supposed to be between the range of around 5.5 uh, to around 6.5, which is usually optimum for, uh, for optimum for tomato production. And we also have to look at how best our soils are um, set in terms of the nutritional status that they have. Uh, for us to get to know this, we have to get our soils tested. Soils should be tested so that we get to know the nutritional status of our soil and how best we can try to come through and uh, try to correct the soil, condition it if the pH is not right within the range that we want it to be. Then lastly, the management. These are the good agronomic practices. Pest management, which is me, which means that we're going to bring in our insecticides or we can bring in, um, as uh, Zizai had mentioned, the uh, integrated pest management systems, which might bring in the, uh, the, the traps that might help to control some of the pests that might affect our crops. Uh, like the tutor, we are having tutor traps, or we can just try to bring in uh, nutritional management as well, and also try to bring in uh, by um, uh, uh, using pest, uh, uh, pesticides that work well to make sure that our crop is always going at its maximum. And then also disease protection. We have to make sure that we can make sure that our, uh, our crop is disease-free, and we have to make sure that at any point our tomato uh, is not going to be attacked in severe way by any disease. And then also we have to look at the weed management. We also have to look at, uh, we also have to look at the field hygiene. These are essential elements that we have to look at. So it's important that we try by almost to look at that. The uh, one thing that Citgo has is, obvious, we're always talking about the hybrid seeds. What are the hybrid seeds? What are these F1 seeds, first generation seeds that we're talking about? These are high value vegetable seeds that combine the best traits of their parents to make sure that we get an offspring which has the necessary traits that um, uh, the, it's, it's going to get from both of its parents. So in terms of, the, uh, we could look at uh, some elements that we might try to look at. We'll try to look at the yield, trying to combine good yield and better disease tolerance. We can try to make sure that we bring that by combining two different parents that, is the, that have the traits that we're going to look for. And these are developed through controlled cross-pollination. So it's necessary to uh, know that Citco doesn't do uh, GMO seeds. So all of our seed is GMO free and uh, the government of Zimbabwe doesn't even allow for us to sell GMO seeds. So all of the seeds that we sell at Citco is not uh, GMO, it's not genetically modified. So all of these uh, hybrid seeds, they exhibit hybrid vigor, a superior performance that we try to look at when it comes to, um, when it comes to um, our, uh, our seed and uh, in terms of the traits that we're looking for. Um, we, we, we know that we're going to get them if we're going to get our hybrid seeds. If Citgo says our hybrid tomato is going to give us a yield which usually averages this much, we know that we're going to get that um, if everything, if uh, our crop is managed well and everything goes very well. Moving on to the next slide. 
Uh, one thing that we have to see um, uh, as the farmer is to try to see the benefits that hybrid seeds try to bring at the table. The first thing that we have to look at is the high yield, high returns from investment. We have tomatoes that can give you high yields per plant, uh, per, per plant. because when we're now looking at uh, most of these horticultural crops, we're, now, we're no longer looking at, uh, as compared to maize, where we look at having a certain area giving us this much yield. We're now looking at an individual plant giving us a certain amount of yields that we are going to be trying to target. So if we we'll say at Citgo, our tomato is going to give us an average of around six kgs per plant, we know that we're going to get that because with hybrids, we know that uniformity is something that is key to that. And we know that each and every plant, if managed well, can give us a certain yield, which is kind of very much guaranteed if everything goes um, according to the book. Uniformity of key traits, fruit size, shape, and maturity. Uniformity of key traits is necessary because we don't want you to grow your crop. Citgo sells you a crop, a tomato crop, Daisy F1, for example, and says it's going to give you big ground tomatoes. We, if you use our hybrid seeds, we know that for certain that most of our crop is going to give us um, those round uh, tomatoes that we're going to look, less of the chances of getting uh, the gem tomatoes that we may be looking at, the gem tomatoes or any other misshaping tomato that we might get within our seed. If we guarantee you that you're going to get round tomatoes, that's what you're going to get. Shape also is something that we have to look at. Then the maturity, we know that our crop is going to mature close to around the same time. High growth figure, we're looking at healthy crops which have excellent growth uh, habits and they exhibit good vigor in terms of how they grow. They don't show uh, um, some restraint when it comes to their growth. We know that we're going to get something like that. The healthy crop, which is going to be growing at its optimum. Disease tolerance and resistance. It's very necessary, especially when we're going to grow our tomatoes during the rainy season, where we have a lot of disease pressure. You guaranteed of a better, of a clean crop due to the tolerance and the resistance. But the farmers should know the difference between the tolerance and the resistance, because a lot of them usually get to confuse the two. Tolerance means that your tomato crop can have a certain degree of trying to tolerate a certain disease. It's not going to be heat. It's going to show some element of trying to fight an infection that might want to um, uh, affect it. So uh, it's necessary to, for us to get to know the tolerance and the resistance of any crop. High quality products, color, flavor, nutrition, and taste. These are some of the elements that we have to look at uh, uh, if we're going to choose our seed for hybrid seeds. And another thing, long shelf life we're going to be guaranteed of shelf lives that go over 12 days even uh, under storage without having our tomatoes starting to rot. And lastly, our tomatoes, our hybrid tomatoes are suited for their target markets. We're looking at the open markets, the restaurants and the supermarkets. And we're also looking at the processing market as well, where they need the gem tomatoes. For most of the markets here upwards, uh, uh, around here in Mashona Land, we know that uh, there's a huge uh, bias towards round tomatoes. If we have our round tomatoes, we know that we're going to sell them a little bit much more easier uh, if we're going to be growing our uh, if we're going to be growing our tomatoes. But if we have our processing market, we know that for certain we need to grow our gem tomatoes. If you're growing for the market that is going to be around the Manikalan area, there's a huge bias towards. Um, gem tomatoes around those areas. So uh, uh, it's necessary for us to get to know the right variety to choose if we're going to grow our tomatoes during those, uh, around those areas. So basically, if you're going to choose um, um, your, your seed goal, uh, hybrid tomato seeds, one of the major traits that you have to look at is the target market. Get to know which target market you are going to go for and get to ask your seed goal agronomist which uh, variety is going to best perform uh, and is not going to be a, a bit harder to sell yeah, within a certain region that we're going to try to sell to. And then another thing as well, the shelf life. Some markets um, are usually a bit of a distance away. Uh, you look at possibly um, the market around the Marunde Ramacheke getting into Manika land, you get a lot of uh, buyers coming through from uh, Mozambique. And these are tomatoes that are going to probably travel uh, a bit of a longer distance and they have to get to their target market in the best shape. You need a variety which has a long shelf life, good skin, something that is not going to get to the target market in a bad state. And then obviously the high quality and the uniformity. Those are something that are some of the things that we have to look at. And then lastly, disease tolerance. Disease tolerance is very important if we're going to grow our tomatoes during the rainy season. So basically we have to make sure that we're always at the top of our game when it comes to that. Uh, uh, here's a bit of a quick uh, look at our tomato gross margin budget. Uh, this is a tomato gross margin that I used with uh, one of our lower, um, one of our lower um, 
yielding varieties when it comes to um, the yield that you can get per hectare. I used Petra Rosa, which is uh, one of the varieties that we sell at Sitco. That has the best shelf life amongst all the tomatoes that we sell. And this is a tomato that is sold also to the processing markets. Most of those guys who use the uh, tomatoes, process them into tomato purees, to, to uh, process them into tomato sauces and all of those, they use the Petra Rosa variety. Um, looking at the average yield that most of our farmers usually get with this tomato, it's around 80,000, uh, around 80 tons at the 80,000 kgs. Um, using that, we can look at the average pack out percent, we can, which can get to around 85% after grading our tomatoes, which leaves us with a net yield of around 68 tons of tomatoes. Variable cost of production per hectare, they can hover between around 4.8 to around 5.5 over a full hectare. But this is a tomato that is not quite as demanding when it comes to a lot of material like the trail sinks and also the other labors as well. So we have to try to look at uh, variable cost of production that can average around 4.8 over a full hectare. Variable cost of production per kg can average around 7 cents and the farm get price at our lowest here in Zimbabwe. I'm pretty sure over the past weeks, uh, during the early uh, weeks of the year, uh, the tomatoes were averaging around 20 cents per kilo. Uh, which is around six uh, six dollars per thirty kg uh, crate. So the farm get price it can hover at towards between around twenty to twenty five cents. But in this case, I use twenty five cents, which gives us a gross return that can hover close to around seventeen thousand uh, dollars, giving us a gross profit of around twelve dollars, uh, twelve thousand uh, dollars, and one hundred seven twelve thousand one hundred seventy four dollars with a return per dollar invested that can look at uh, around three dollars fifty two. Um, uh, $3.52 per each and every dollar that we invest. So basically the ratio can uh, be between one is to three or one is to 3.5, depending on the price that we uh, sell our tomatoes at. Uh, as we go, I'm now starting to look at the varieties that Citgo offers to you as farmers. And I'll start off with the open field round tomatoes. We, I'll start off with one of our star varieties. This is Daisy F1. Daisy is our best yielding variety in the open field giving us a yield that can hover close to around 150 to 180 tons over a full hectare. This variety is a long shelf life variety that can as a shelf life that can go over 14 days in terms of uh, storage ability and it gives bright red fruits which are uniform in color. Maturity is around 80 days from the day of transplanting and the plant type is a determinate plant type which means that it won't grow more than a meter during the bulk of the summer period. But we've noticed that during the rainy season, uh, we, this variety gets so excited that it can even grow up to around 1.2 to around 1.5 meters in height, which means that it can also get to be very vigorous. But one thing about it, uh, the one thing that most farmers usually know days for is the size of the tomato. It gives a, a tomato uh, that averages around, uh, uh, 200 to 250 grams in size, which is around, uh, which is a large tomato, if you ask me. Um, so some markets, they might ridicule it, some markets, they might want it, but it's something that we have to make sure that us as farmers, we get to uh, do our market surveys and get to know if the market can really get a variety, which is like daisy. But one of the major things that we usually market daisy for is because of this disease tolerance package that it has. It has a massive disease tolerance package, which can get up to around, um, uh, which can, uh, the, the package can, uh, it includes a, a, a bit of a wider disease tolerance package, which includes viral diseases, and also looking at one of the major diseases that affect our tomatoes, which is the late blight. Uh, Daisy seems to have a very good tolerance towards uh, late flight, and it means that during the rainy season, it's one of the varieties that we can try to go for, just to make sure that we have a tomato when most of the farmers are usually struggling to grow a certain variety during that time. So it's very necessary for us to try to look at the major advantage of Daisy, which is the size and also the disease tolerance package that it has. The next variety is uh, called uh, Nash F1. Nash is a variety that we sell in conjunction with Syngenta, and it's a variety which gives us medium-sized fruits. As I mentioned on Daisy, one of the things that most people try to, um, one of the things that people uh, usually uh, give us feedback about is the size of the tomato for Daisy. Some say that for the open market, it might be a little bit big, especially during the periods when there's a lot of tomato on the market, they struggle to sell those tomatoes. But now, if you have the market where you're going to sell your tomatoes during that time, during a market, uh, during a time when there are a lot of tomatoes on the market, it would be much more better to invest in a much more medium-sized tomato, which is days, uh, which is Nash F1, which is a variety that is used for the fresh market and gives firm fruits, high yielding, 
and uh, the good crop day shelf life as well. This is a variety that can give us a tonnage potential of between around 120 to around 130 tons over a full hectare. Maturity is in 80 days and the plant type is a determinate open field. Some people actually grow this without any trellising because it's a bush type. But one thing that we have to try to look at is obviously that uh, with Nash, it has a concentrated fruit set. It means that it will give you a massive amount of fruits within a shorter space of period. So uh, you have to be ready uh, to kick in, especially when it starts to ripen, because it will give you pressure. Uh, most of the tomatoes actually just get to ripen off within a short space of time. So you as the farmer, you have to be ready for that as well. But one disadvantage, obviously, you can grow this. Um, it, this, pressure, this tomato is going to get a lot of disease pressure during the rainy season. Um, so it's something that we have to look at. Um, if your area doesn't get as much rainfall and if you rely more on you supplementing your crop, this is a variety that you can grow. But if you are going to have a challenge where you're going to grow your crop during um, uh, a period uh, when it's raining, this is a variety that I would feel like it's a bit avoidable. And it's a variety, and this is a time when we usually recommend daisy more. Uh, as we go on, we're going to the open field gem tomatoes. We have Petra Rosa F1, which is, uh, as you can see, it's a bit of a tiny, uh, type of fruit. It gives us 100 gram fruits. But one of the things that most of the farmers like, and also something that most of our uh, uh, marketers like, uh, which are the uh, ladies who sell um, Zika, and we also look at uh, the guys at the, uh, at the most of the market, the, um, uh, we're looking at the Sakuvas, we're looking at the Mbares, is usually something that is the shelf life. The shelf life of Petra Rosa is amazing. This is a tomato that can even go over 21 days without showing any sign of deterioration. You actually start to see the skin starting to shrivel before this tomato starts to rot. So it takes a lot of effort to actually get to make sure that this tomato gets to rot. It's a variety that is a hybrid content. Uh, and this is something that is necessary for most of uh, the farmers who are targeting to grow their tomato for the processing market. Most of the processors like a tomato that has a rich content that offers between around five to six uh, percent in terms of the sugar content that the tomato has. And this is a variety that has a high bridge content of around 5.5 each. It's high yielding, gives us around 80 to 90 uh, tons per hectare. And that is very top processing variety. Maturity, 75 days. Plant type is determinate, which means that it's a bush type tomato. This tomato, during the drier periods of the year, you can entirely grow this variety without putting any tracing on it. You can grow it without actually putting any tracing, without coming in with any uh, support for this plant because it's a tomato that is bred uh, just to make sure that um, it gives so much ease when it comes to harvesting. And also it's less, um, it, it gives um, our farmers the chance to grow a lot of hectares without knowing that, uh, without any fear that our tomato is going to have any pressure when it comes to um, having uh, labor that is needed to try to train our crop. Fruit shape is oval shape, and the average fruit size is around 100 grams. Uh, so this is our tomato pressure rosa. The next one is HTX14, which is a variety that is very uh, good uh, for processing as well, with a high bridge content of around 5%, uh, 5 in terms of the sugar content that it has. It has good fruit setting under high temperatures, which means that you can grow this even in the low field because of its high adaptability. It's a very early hybrid and it's also blocky round shaped as well, which means that you can plug it both into the open market and also to the processing market quite easily. The fruits, uh, the plant has a good uh, leaf cover, which means that your fruits are not going to be quite much exposed to the sun and get damaged by sunburn. I recommend the plant spacing. We're looking at around 25,000 to 30,000 plus per hectare with um, an average fruit weight of around 90 to 130 grams in size. Days to maturity, we're looking at six to eight days from the day of transplant. And disease tolerance, we're looking at a package that includes tolerance to bacterial world, high resistance to tomato mosaic virus, and also in an intermediate resistance to tomato yellow leaf kale virus. Uh, then the last variety on the gem tomatoes is Shibli, which is another tomato that is suited for both the open market and also the processing market. It's a variety that we sell in conjunction with Syngenta as well. And uh, it's a variety that uh, is uh, very good for both markets. Maturity is in 70 days. Plant type is determinate vigorous. And you can grow this without trellising, just like with the HTH14 and also with the Petra Rosa. The shape is blocky round. In the average fruit size, we're looking at 110 gram fruit. Tolerance, it has a good tolerance um, to, um, it has a good tolerance to uh, root knot nematodes, which is something that our farmers have to look at, especially where they have a lot of pressure 
when it comes to um, nematodes. So this is a variety that can come through and try to uh, tolerate um, against uh, high uh, nematode um, infestations during those uh, in those areas. Then the next uh, set of tomatoes that I'm going to talk about are the tomatoes that we grow um, in the greenhouse, which are the indeterminate tomatoes. Those tomatoes that can be harvested for long periods that can over up to around six months in terms of the harvest period. The first variety I'll talk about, which is the one on the screen, is called Oasis F1. Oasis is a vigorous indeterminate variety that matures in 75 days from the date of transplant fruit weight. We're looking at around 200 grams with bright red quality fruits, just like you can see in that picture. It's got uniform uh, round smooth uh, tomatoes and it's a variety that can be grown both in the open and also under greenhouse conditions as well, giving us good yields in both spaces. So it's none of the variety that we have to try to look at if we're looking at getting a variety that can give us the highest possible yield even in the open field, even in a greenhouse. Always this is one of those varieties. The next one is called Alhambra. Alhambra is for those farmers who don't want me, uh, who don't want large tomatoes if they're going to grow them under their greenhouse conditions. It's high yielding, versatile, and it's indeterminate. At this period, up to six months as well, under protected environments. Uh, our fruits were looking at round firm fruits that average between 160 to 180 grams, and maturity is in 90 days it's vigorous, plus good leaf cover is another trick that we love about it. The fruits are always protected. And it's a variety that can be grown in the open and in the greenhouse, but it thrives so much under greenhouse conditions. Yield potential, we're looking at around 15 to 20 kgs over um, or its whole lifespan under protected environments. And it's got high resistance to tomato mosaic virus, uh, leaf mold, and also nematodes as well. So this variety, Alhambra, greenhouse tomato, and uh, major selling point being a medium-sized tomatoes, uh, being a medium-sized tomato that can cover both the open market and also some of the markets uh, like the fresh markets uh, where they sell based on kgs. The last variety that I'll mention today is Candela F1, which is a variety that is quite popular with our greenhouse farmers because of the good quality of the fruits that it has. But it's, uh, uh, it has some of the biggest fruits amongst our basket. It has fruits that can average between 200 to 250 grams. In some cases we've gotten uh, uh, some farmers actually selling it, uh, getting about uh, close to around three tomatoes uh, uh, per kg even. So it's something that is uh, it's a variety that is quite big and uh, it's very suited for greenhouse production, which is usually its best uh, possible area. Maturity is in 70 to 75 days from the date of transplant. And one thing we love about it is the short internals. It means that uh, our tomato is not going to grow too tall. Uh, with uh, lots of spaces between the two fruits, uh, between the two clusters of fruits. So it's a variety that can give us a uh, short internal, give us clusters that can have between around six to seven fruits per plant, and we'll get an average of around 200 um, uh, grams per each and every fruit. It's high yielding, which is something that we have to try to look at. And being a greenhouse tomato, which means that you can grow this all year round. And it's a variety that you can even grow for selling during the winter period or even during the rainy period, just for the fact that this is very good under the conditions that are protected. So that's something that we have to look at. Land and bed preparation. It's something that um, is very important for tomatoes because tomatoes are deep rooters. We have tomatoes having roots that can even go over a meter long. So deep plowing our land is something that is going to be necessary if we are going to grow our tomatoes. So that at least we give our roots so much uh, space for them to uh, develop very, very well and for them to penetrate very well in the soil without any interference of having the soil being uh, too compact for the roots to actually penetrate into the soil. So it's necessary for us to try to bring in uh, our disc plow and uh, try to plow and then disc after, try to make sure that our plow gets down to around 45 to 50 centimeters um, uh, down into the soil. Uh, another thing that is necessary, good soil depth is necessary, but also soil tilt as well. We need to make sure that our soil tilt is quite fine so that our roots can penetrate very well in the soil. Preparation of raised beds and ridges is very important, especially during the rainy period. Uh, when it's during the rainy period, we get a lot of water, um, sometimes even getting to log within our soil. But if we make sure that we get raised beds or even put ridges up, it's important for us because it increases the soil volume, it increases the root development, and it also improves the water drainage as well. It means that water is not going to collect within the rooting zone of our plant. So 
bed uh, preparation is necessary. We can put our tomatoes on ridges or we can put them on beds. All of those are necessary. We can try to look at that. So the important takeaway thing from this is to make sure that we dip plow and also we raise our beds uh, or put up our ridges where we're going to put ridges. Make sure that our tomato is not going to grow within a condition where the roots might be confined within um, a space where water might log and it might affect the performance of our crop. That's something that is necessary. For greenhouse farmers, uh, we've seen a lot of farmers starting to get into the um, um, idea of putting up fertility trenches, which um, just like in the open field, we deep plow within our greenhouse. We make trenches that are around 45 to 50 centimeters deep, which will start to layer with some important components that improve our soil and also improve our plants to actually absorb some of those nutrients that are necessary. We make three layers. This is usually one at the bottom, one in the middle of the trench, and we put another layer at the top as well. So layering is important if we're going to put our tomatoes under greenhouse conditions. Within the open field, the labor that might come with that might be a bit tiresome. But within a greenhouse, we know that we have a bit of a confined area. So layering might be actually quite important with that as well. Plant spacing, we need to use appropriate spacing to improve ventilation within our fields. Yeah, ventilation is very important because especially right now during the rainy season, or to those farmers who use overhead irrigation, one of the things that we get to notice is that we get to wet our foliage. Um, wetting our foliage, in, uh, it kind of encourages um, our, or it makes our plant a bit more susceptible to fungal infection. So it's necessary for us if we're going to be using some of those elements or even just growing generally just to make sure that our crop is uh, well ventilated. It's very important for us to put in row spacings and enter row spacings that encourage uh, good air movement within our field. In row spacing, therefore, uh, that we can use for our tomatoes is around 30 to 40 centimeters. 30, especially if we want to target high populations, we can use 30 centimeters uh, in row, which we can uh, put up with an interval spacing of around 100 uh, centimeters, which is like one meter apart uh, and it can give us some uh, room for movement as well within our field. But for some very vigorous varieties like daisy, you might actually get to uh, need to put a bigger interval spacing so that at least when our um, uh, workers or all our farmers farmers are getting into the field, we, get to, we don't get to disturb our crop when we get to brush around our crop and that might actually help with spreading diseases as well. So it's necessary to try to look at the traits that our variety has and get the necessary interval and interval spacing. During the rainy season, some farmers even go up to around 1.5 uh, meters in terms of interval spacing, just to give that extra space for our farmers to walk in and also for better ventilation within the field. Lower plant populations can be targeted with a range from 18K to 22,000 plants per hectare being targeted during the rainy season. This is just because of the higher interval spacing that we're going to put. And we also might have to push up the indoor spacing as well, just to improve the ventilation within our field. That uh, if it rains or probably if we come through with our overhead sprays, we get to, um, uh, our plant gets to dry up a little bit faster. We have lesser cases of our leaves holding onto um, a lot of water on their surface. Fertilization, this is something that is guided by our soil tests. So soil testing is necessary. Get our soils analyzed and get to make sure that we get good recommendation, especially from our fertilizer companies. I'm glad that uh, my brother Caleb is in, uh, is in uh, 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 this forum as well. He will come through and actually maybe try to expand on that as well. But good soil tests are necessary to get to know the best uh, fertilizer that we can put our crop, the best way that we can doctor our soil to get to um, unleash the potential that our seed to seed corn has. Uh, usually our general recommendation is a buffer of around 900 kgs per hectare of compound C, uh, which is our 6, 15, 12. And we can also bring gypsum as well uh, as a supplement for our uh, calcium that we need within our crop. We can bring it um, into our soil. And this is something that can be dictated by soil test results or that can be recommended by our fertilizer companies. Then our top dressing, we can split ammonium nitrate uh, 150 kgs between week two, three, and four. So that might mean some farmers can bring in their cup number two for each and every plant, putting on each and every plant uh, at week two, week three, and week four. And then on week four, we can uh, bring in our sulfate to potash. We can bring uh, 50 kgs at week four as well that we can apply at the same time as our ammonium nitrate just to make sure that uh, we supply our potassium there and also our sulfur. Uh, 
at the onset of flowering, we can uh, start to alternate calcium nitrate and uh, potassium nitrate at one week intervals from the first flowers, from site of the first flowers on a weekly basis at a rate of 10 grams per one liter. So this is basically a 1% solution, which means that in a NEPSEC, uh, if we're going to apply this as a foliar spray, within a NEPSEC, we're going to be applying around 160 grams within a 16 liter NEPSEC, 160 grams of either calcium or potassium nitrate, which we're going to put on our crop. And then uh, it's important to know that we have to stop all our fertilization four weeks prior to our final harvest as well. Then we move on to some of the major things that affect our crops, the major pest, tuta absoluta. This is one hell of a uh, pest that affects our, uh, most of our tomato farmers here in Zimbabwe. It, uh, ever since it came through in Zimbabwe, it's been uh, one of the most important pests that we have to make sure that we try to control by any means necessary. Tuta absoluta, looks like this. The major thing that affects us is usually uh, our, uh, um, uh, our lava. As you can see there, the lava is obviously um, the lava of this moth, which you can see, uh, which is the tutor absoluta moth. As you can see, the moth lays the eggs and the legs, um, uh, and the egg, when the eggs hatch, they produce the lava and the lava is the one which starts to bore into our fruits, as you can see on most of the tomatoes that are um, on the frame three. So it's something that we have to try to look at, make sure that we try to control the stutter absolutely by any means necessary. The symptom, they are usually blood-shaped mines within the leaves. You see uh, so many uh, lines within our, uh, within our leaves. And you also start to see puncture marks on the fruits as well. The puncture marks are usually the major problem because they lead to uh, damages to our fruits. The damage to our fruits through the puncher, uh, we might get a secondary infection that might come through and actually make our fruits to start to rot. So we need to control this one. We need to control this tutor absoluta. And we are, there are a lot of chemicals that can come through as well uh, that can be used to control our tutor absoluta, which, uh, which might include the emamectin benzoates, uh, we emamectin benzoate, indoxacarb. We also have chemicals uh, that can come through. Um, and uh, uh, there are a lot of chemicals that can be used to try to control this disease. But one of the major things that we have to try to look at is obviously the need for us to alternate to make sure that we rotate our chemicals because with tutor, tutor is a problem of getting to, um, it's, it gets to resist to a lot of uh, chemicals quite quickly. So we need to make sure that we don't overuse the same chemical over and over. Otherwise our pest might uh, get a better resistance and we will see a lesser and lesser reaction to our chemicals that will be applied. And uh, integrated um, pest management systems that can be used for this, you can use your tutor traps as well, which come with pheromones. The pheromones are the hormones that attract the males of the tutor absoluta. And if we kill the males, we know that, yeah, uh, we're going to kill the whole clan. So it's necessary for us to try to bring this and use it in combination with our pesticides as well to try to control this. So let's try to make sure that we control the disease by any means necessary. Red spider mite is another thing that we as well that we have to try to look at. Red spider mite is a bit of a hard one to, for us to actually play with. As you can see with our red spider, it gets to affect our crops, it affects our leaf areas and it affects our fruit quality as well. It affects our yield quite very, very well. So it's necessary for us to try to make sure that we control it by um, all means. It's usually spotted on the underside of the leaves and you can see webbings on the underside of the leaves as well, just like the webbings that you see from a spider. Uh, it uh, gives a yellowish white appearance on the leaves of the plant. As you can see on this one, it starts to give some white, um, some, uh, it gets to give some white uh, um, residue or some whiteness that you can see on the, on the leaves. The best try way to try to control this is using a caricide like the amitras and the upper mentions. They can be used in alternation to make sure that we keep this uh, pest at bay. Otherwise, it will um, affect our tomato farmers by any means um, in terms of dropping their uh, yields. Uh, the, on the diseases, uh, the major diseases that I can talk about today, since our time is a little bit limited, we can talk of uh, late blight, which has been one of the diseases that has been a problem over the past couple of years. Last year, I feel like, yeah, we had a bit of a new strain that was affecting a lot of our farmers. And it was very, very fast in the way that it acted. So this is one disease that, I make sure, that we have to make sure that our farmers have to know um, uh, by any means necessary because it will affect our tomato crops quite well. Um, as you can see, this is the way that it appears. 
some farmers, when they call me, they'll be telling me, Francis, we have tomatoes that my tomato leaves are looking as if someone poured water, water on them. I think as you can see, it's looking like as if uh, there was some water that was poured on it, some hot water that was poured on it. But yeah, this is the disease that is a bit of a problem for us. Uh, this uh, disease um, is devastates our tomato plants during the cold rainy weather season. Right now, these are the conditions that it, where it, it performs really well under. It appears as if the leaves are water soft on the areas of the leaves that, uh, and this kind of enlarges to form uh, greenish black blotches on the leaves. The affected fruits have brown blotches on them and they rapidly deteriorate. It also affects the stems, which usually exhibit brownish black spots that spread after the plant if left uncontrolled. Control, we can try to make sure that we bring in uh, pest, uh, fungicides that can really cure this disease once it's there. But the best way is obviously to try to make sure that we try to bring our preventative fungicides at a regular scale, especially during this time. Whenever it rains, let's try to bring in our chemicals, especially with some wetting agents or even mineral oil, to make sure that our chemical stays on the leaf for a longer time. It doesn't get to get washed off fast during the rainy season that we are at. And also one thing that we have to look at, another cultural practice that we can try to use is obviously to water at the base of the plant, especially during the dry periods. Watering at the base of the plant, it helps avoid the leaves getting wet. And just like I mentioned in the past, wetting our leaves encourages diseases. So it's necessary for us to make sure that we uh, try to control this. We need to use tolerant varieties uh, that have uh, better tolerance, just like the Daisy F1 that I mentioned, which performs very well under the conditions that we have right now. And then we encourage regular use of fungicide in crop rotation. Once we start noticing some diseases within this crop, there are so many chemicals that we can try to bring in and try to control this. Some of them, um, uh, you can get a lot of chemicals. I'm pretty sure that I will mention some of them, which include chemicals like Infinito, chemicals like uh, Infinito from Bea or Amistad Top from Syngenta. These are chemicals that can help come through and also help to cure this disease uh, as we go, prevent its spread, uh, further spread. So let's try to make sure that we keep this disease at bay. Uh, then the other disease is the early blight. Uh, early blight is usually shown uh, by brown to black spots which are on the leaves of the plant. The leaves turn yellow and they start to dry off on the leaves and they have multiple spots. Attacks on the fruits from the stem, uh, attacks on the fruits uh, start from the stem and they cause uh, large sunken areas where the fruit connects to the stem, uh, right at the top there. Uh, that's where usually we start to see that control. We can try to bring in our fungicide uh, applications uh, to prevent this disease. We can bring in our copper oxychloride, our mango zeds, our tap corners, also try to control to, to prevent this disease from getting in. And uh, we need to uh, use uh, uh, good control of, uh, we need to use uh, good uh, curative fungicides as well to control this disease. Curative fung fungicides, they include the amistops and the infinitos that I had mentioned also other chemicals that um, are there as well then the, that can control this are the anthropos that you can try to bring in to try to control this crop rotation necessary uh, so that at least we prevent any disease carry over from one uh, from, uh, uh, one uh, generation of a crop to the other. And then we also need to reduce the amount of the time that the leaves have to be wet. So we have to make sure that we just try by all means not to wet our foliage as much. And uh, this is how it looks. You can clearly see some of the uh, uh, black sunken spots that I have mentioned there uh, on the leaves and it starts to yellow as it starts to gen uh, the point of actually getting to start to dry off. So that's how basically how it looks. And then uh, this is my last slide. And um, on my last slide, I'll talk about the field hygiene, which is something that I feel like our farmers have to know. Field hygiene, it involves proper disposal of pruned material, especially during this rainy season. Some of the leaves that get to uh, get in contact with the soil during the damp, uh, when the soil is a little bit damp, uh, we need to uh, make sure that we kind of prune them. But it's necessary to make sure that we try to prune them and to dispose of them quite quickly. It also involves avoiding contaminating fields with diseases when we work from one field to another. So moving from one field to another might be a bit of a challenge as well for this. Pruning lower leaves, um, it's recommended to have lesser leaves which are in contact with the, with the soil. But as we soon as we uh, prune, it's necessary for us to bring a fungicide to make sure that we get to disinfect the wounds that we would have created on the leaves that can um, affect um, our farmers, uh, that can affect our crop in the future because that might be a port of entry for any infection that might get into our crop. So basically, yeah, this is mostly uh, most of the things that I feel like 
our farmers should know as we go, uh, especially as we start to get to um, uh, start our tomatoes. We need to make sure that we grow our tomatoes quite successfully. So the best way that we can do this is to try by all means to uh, make sure that we manage our crop very, very well. So yeah, this is mostly it from me. Back to you, uh, Mr. Rollins.